that uh, you're not going anywhere, but uh, just get used to that. Thank you, Naomi. That was wonderful. A um, couple of announcements this morning. Uh, just a big thank you to uh, to uh, Sir Nancy for and Billy uh, Joe for uh, decorating the sanctuary and out and about looks really good because it's that Christmassy feel. Um, also, uh, to those that put those Christmas bags together for the kids, I've uh, heard really good things about it, and, uh, and so that's been a, a very good plus. Um, also, to uh, Connie and Raquel, and well, Jessica's not here, but hopefully she'll be in Texas, uh, for putting that whole online service uh, together that worked out really well. And Jessica's a taskmaster. She really gets things done. Good. Um, also, we'll be having the Christmas Eve service here at 7 o'clock on the 24th. So put that on your calendar and uh, keep Christmas being uh, positive, positive thing. All right. Uh, let's stand for the call to worship. We're going to be doing a, a reading off the, off the street. Our souls magnify the Lord. Our spirits the Mighty One has done great things for us. Holy is God's name. Let us worship God. And let us the Maker and our Redeemer. From generation to generation, God is mercy. All right. We are going to do some hymn singing, and we are actually going to have you choose some favorite Christmas carols. And, uh, and we're going to challenge Naomi to see if you can. Does <laughs> so anyone have a favorite you want to sing? Oh, Holy Night. Oh, Holy Night? Uh, Gotta figure out what hymn number it is.
Two verses? Yeah. All right.
comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garment instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. We light these candles as a sign of our waiting and hope for the coming Christ. I'm going to invite the children to come down.
Let's go through time of prayer. And part of our time of prayer is going to be preparation for communion. And uh, we are going to take communion next week, so we'll prepare for that. Uh, but as we do that, um, is there any other prayer requests other than what we find in our role for this morning? Yeah. Uh, you bet, Samantha. Back up. Yeah. Man, it's up new baby. I called him this week and said, how's it going? And it's fine. It's going good. So it's probably just one more item to deliver, right? <laughs> Bring them on. Yeah. I'd like to mention several items that General Flynn uh, suggested we pray for our nation. It's, it's a time, a crucial time for our nation. One is uh, that truth triumphs over lies. That justice triumphs over abuse and fraud. That honesty triumphs over corruption. That honor triumphs over infamy. That faithfulness to our God and our family and our country and its constitution and our president. Faithfulness triumphs over betrayal. And order triumphs over destruction. That we want to follow the constitutional procedure. Good list. Also, um, Linda went and uh, had a consultation, had a bunch of tests, all the fun, and uh, came back that surgery is not an option. And, uh, and so, so the spot was found on the spinal column, and it's hoped that a needle biopsy of that area could be done this week. Uh, so we continue to pray to give, uh, give us peace and comfort to them, and, uh, and that you'll use the situation with glory this week. Well, for everything we go through, but this is a tough, tough thing. So we'll continue to pray. Bob. Give yeah, thanks for you and Jennifer and Vaughn and I getting through the COVID. That's for sure. Getting through COVID. Not fun. Dan Thompson is a friend of many of ours and he used to be a neighbor of yours. People long back ago. But um, he has COVID and is in the hospital with uh, lung issues. Okay. Not naming it pneumonia or anything, but it seems to be, I think that's kind of compounding everything, but just the typical fluid on the lung.
for rest fully assured that when God finds this contrite trust to godly intention, God will forgive all of our sins and make us worthy partakers of this heavenly kingdom. So as we examine ourselves, let's go before God. Almighty God, we have sinned against you. We've sinned against one another. We've done this in thought, word, and deed. In what we have done and what we have left undone. So this morning, in silence, we, we offer up our confessions before you. Father, we thank you for the mercy you have on us. We thank you that you sent your Son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. That we could go before you and request that. And we could be assured because of your word to know that we are covered. Lord, as I talk to the kids about the Holy Spirit coming, we thank you for your Holy Spirit to guide us, to comfort us, to be with us in the most difficult of times. So Lord, we ask that you continue to be with Macy in her cancer and with her family. We ask that you be with my brother as he continues to improve slowly. So thank you for the of the efforts and everything that's gone into how far he's come. Lord, we lift up Kevin and Mona Sue and, and Dan as they deal with COVID. And we may ask a bring healing to their body. Lord, this morning we lift up Linda with the news that she got this week. And we ask that you bring comfort to them and peace. That whatever happens, Lord, it will be to your glory. Use each one of us as we try and, and become your children the way that you want us to become. Lord, we also thank you for new life. And we thank you for Samantha Rebecca as she has entered into this world. And we ask that you be with, with Matt and Stephanie as they begin to care for her. And as she joins this family. Lord, we also lift up our nation as it continues to be not at peace. And Lord, it's almost everything opposite of what you have called for us to exhibit with peace and justice and honor giving our word and living up to it. Lord, may we and, and your people be an example to this country of what it means to be all those things. May we not follow in those footsteps of being angry and resentful. Lord, help us to be examples, especially in this time of the year, with, with hope and joy and love and peace. As we worship you here this morning, we thank you for this opportunity. We ask that you continue to keep us healthy, and we thank you for bringing us through uh, those that have gone through the COVID that uh, you brought us back to health. <coughs> continue to be with those that just continue to fight this, this virus, and may it disappear. We ask for it to go. The Lord, as long as it's here, help us to be great examples, again, to support those around us, to love those around us. God, this morning we ask this all through your Son's name in this, in this season as we wait for you to come. Or probably more than ever, we've said those words, come, Lord Jesus, more often than before. 
So Lord, we wait on you. And we wait on your leading, we wait on your coming. Father, we ask this all through your Son's name. Amen. One of the great things about knowing that we are forgiven are these great words of assurance that the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise that I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall ex execute justice and righteousness in the land, one of the things that we continually pray for. And in those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will be in safety, live in safety. So what is named by which it is called, the Lord is our righteous, and we are made right with God. Amen. This time we'll receive our morning offering. And if we have any deacons that can come up. Alright, let's pray. Lord Jesus, in celebration of your coming amongst us, accept these birthday gifts that we offer you today. And these are all but a small token of what you mean to us, a tiny percentage of what we truly owe to you. So help us not to stop with these gifts, Lord, but to give all things, our whole selves, over to you, just as you have given yourself to us. So it is in your mighty and wonderful name that we pray. Amen.
51. Christ, 
that he was the gift. He was the one he was sending. He was this Messiah that Isaiah was pointing to. And the gift that he was going to give was the gospel. As the good news to the poor, good news to the oppressed, good news to those who were marginalized. Because without them, the gospel wouldn't really exist. Now when this was written, when Isaiah was talking to his audience, it was actually those who were rebuilding Jerusalem. Those that we see in Nehemiah and, and, and Ezra. And they were rebuilding and they, there was times they didn't hear from God. They were getting anxious. They were uh, thinking, where is God during all this time? Because what God did is when they went and they rebuilt the city, it wasn't just they come in and they had this big party and they were building. No, there were groups that were not excited about Jerusalem being rebuilt, right? And so there were people coming at them, and so those from exile were going, God, where are you? Protect us, help us. And so Isaiah comes in with this and gives them the hope. So Jesus here, going back to Jesus' ministry, takes it to where it's not so much just something to read. It's something that is coming. It goes against all what the world knew and the world expected. It's the beginning of Jesus' wish list. And Isaiah focuses on what he wanted the people to do. And part of that comes in Micah 6, 8, to where he gives us a little bit of a clue that he wants us to serve as his hands and feet and voice in the world. He wants us to be like Christ. He wants us to be like him. John the Baptist was a great example of what Jesus wanted. He was out, and he was baptizing, and he had this great following. And people came to him and said, there's this Jesus over here. And he's starting to pull your, your followers away. Aren't you upset about that? He says, no. This is what we want. This is I'm here to prepare the way for him. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Perfect example of what we need to be saying. So Jesus is going to come and he's going to save us from the power of sin. And that's what this first part is basically telling us. Jesus is coming and he's going to break the power of sin. It's basic to Christianity, right? Jesus comes and he dies on the cross and he rises again. And that's a great Easter story. Something that we say, well, this is the Easter story, it's a Christmas story. But that's how we get there. We get there through this point. Isaiah is pointing out an important part of God's grace here. He's basically saying that we are going to be forgiven of our sins because of what Christ is going to do in the future. Plan on this Messiah coming. Plan on him saving us from our sin. Now a lot of times when we look at this, we look at this whole resurrection thing is in the past. We, we look at, we're forgiven, and so good, now I'm good. And we walk away. Or we feel that we just do what we can. We continue to sin. One of the things that we look at is basically, is when we're justified, when we become believers, that's, that's where we're good. We feel that we've been cleansed, and now we can move forward. But in verse 2, Isaiah says something different. He declares, he says, the year of the Lord's favor, so that God's people may become a planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now last week, the sermon that you listened to, I got to apologize. Number one, I, was, I had a fever, and I was dead tired. And I, that's one of the things that... Uh, Jessica said, let's get this done. We're going to get this done. Um, and I went rabbit trails and said some things that were wrong. So I'm going to correct them this morning. And this passage is perfect to do that. Because what we do, if we decide that we're going to, we're going to do good works, we're going to do what God wants us to do on our own, who gets the credit for doing that? It'd be me, right? God saved me. God forgives me. 
And so now I'm going to do work, so I'm going to try and do my best, and I can pat myself on the back for doing those great things. It's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. And I believe that's what I think I said last week. And it's not that way at all. If you look at the New Testament, it gives a great uh, picture going back to this passage, reflecting on this passage. In Titus 2, verses 13 and 14, it says, Wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify us, uh, purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. James 2.14 What good is it to brothers if someone says he has faith but not, does not have works? Can that faith save him? And then 1 John 5.4 For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Basically, Isaiah and in the New Testament is basically saying faith and Christian living go together. It's not something we fight for. It's something that we give over to God and God continues to work on us. It's a relationship that we have with God through Christ by faith. So when we say that it's an expression of our faith when we do good works, it sends us in the wrong direction. It gives us credit instead of God. Instead, we are called to hand over everything to God. Everything to God in our life. And that is the hardest thing to ever do. Right? It's the hardest thing that we can do. Because faith in Christ is for the purpose of changing us into the likeness of Christ. And the only way that we can do that is if we give everything to Him and let Him work through us. We have to let him work through us. If we go by the way of we are going to use this as works and, and good things as uh, expression, basically we're setting ourselves up to fail. We are going to sin. Right? And I think I said that. I said we're going to sin anyway, so we need that forgiveness. And that's not what God is saying. That's not what Isaiah is saying here. I've had people tell me, that while well, I gave my life to Christ and I've changed some things, I go to church now and I pray every once in a while and I read my Bible, but nothing's really changed. So there's really, I don't know what God does. There's some people who have come to me and said, well, I gave God a try and it just didn't work for me. I always love that one. It's not self-help book. Well, basically, the question that those who have those ideas are, is do you truly believe in Jesus Christ? Have you given everything over to Christ, or are you just giving him lip service? Are you just doing it to do what you need, think you need to do, or are you handing everything over? So often in our world, you know, we carry these, these phones around, and we want everything instantly. And so we go before God and we say, I have this problem, God. I need you to help me out. So help me out. And it's almost like we tap our foot and wait for him to instantly do it. Because all we have to do when we want anything, right, is call on our phone, get on our phone, get the information. We can get that instantly. And God is not like that at all. Just like when Isaiah was talking to the people in Jerusalem, the exile, uh, those that come back from exile, Sometimes he's going to wait. Sometimes we need to be in a different position before he's going to talk to us. Maybe he's going to say something totally different than what we want. But God's going to do his thing. And so are we truly trusting and believing in God? Because faith is not just something that we just kind of carry a little bit of. It's complete trust in God. It's complete handing over everything to Him. And basically when we do this, when we commit our life to Christ, we're saying that we're going to get rid of all other supports. God is it. He is the only one that we're going to rely on. So when we say, I'm going to give God a try, you're bound to fail. Right? One of the things Paul says in Romans, 
that can make us uncomfortable is he says, we are slaves to Christ. We are slaves to Christ. And basically, we do his bidding. We hand everything over to him, just like a slave would be to a master. And whatever he says, you got to do. And that's basically what we say when we're going to turn. And, and so many people say, well, that sounds awful. You know, I'm not going to be a slave. Well, Paul also says, you're either going to be a slave to Christ or you're going to be a slave to sin. Those are the two choices. You're going to give your life to sin in a way of doing your own thing, or you're going to be a slave to Christ, and you're going to follow and work through the power of God. So we give God the power to take control and, and root out all those things that are killing us. That's when our life changes. That's when we see the power of God in our life. If we turn to just saying that we're just going to give a part of our life and we're giving in and we're allowing defeat to enter in. If we want to wake God out and we trust in Him, believe that He is at work, and we say, Your will be done, not mine, we can see amazing things happen in our lives. We become actually free in Christ and we actually enjoy the joy that can come from following Him. And he gives us a clue of what can happen when you go further into Isaiah, verses 3b uh, through 7, when we look at uh, verse 3, the oaks of righteousness become stronger, right? When Christ is in us, we become a stronger uh, version of ourselves. In verse 1, or in chapter 1, verse 21, he talks about when you live in unrighteousness, when you live in your own way, you become an oak with fading leaves start to die. God says, you need me. And I will be the only one that can transform you. So what does that look? What does that look like when we, when we hand everything over? That means we hand over everything in our relationships. Do our, 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 our relationships reflect our life with God? How about our money? Are we trusting God with our money? One of my friends says, well, usually I get my bills, and, and I pay my bills, and then I will write my check to church if I have anything left. And I said, you got that reverse. Because you write what is God's first, and then see what you have left. God is always first. In our work, is God number one. Think about every area of your life, and the idea behind it is to examine what are we holding back for ourselves? What are we most uncomfortable to give to God? And we need to turn that over to Him. And I know it's really hard. It's very hard. Um, I'm into knowing, and Jennifer too, is, uh, that we're financially secure. It's one of those things. We grew up with it, built into us. And then when things fall apart, we're supposed to be saying, well, God, this is all yours, so everything's just going to happen. We did a, uh, a study called Experiencing God. I don't know if you've ever done that study before. And he talks a lot about the whole idea that God is going to be there for you. Someone comes in and says, you know what, I need you to help us. Um, I felt led to ask you to help us do a mission. And we need you to give us $10,000 to do that. And for him to say, well, okay, we don't have $10,000, but we'll commit to doing that because God will provide. And then that money comes in. It's easy for to do for the church to commit the church to do this. But when it's your own life and God's saying, you need to do this outside of your comfort zone, it's a whole other story. But God calls us to do that on a daily basis with everything in our life. But the cool thing is, is what we find here is that when we do that, when we hand over everything, that we do get to experience the joy of God. We get to see Him at work like you've never seen Him before. And I shared with the, uh, I, I might have shared here, but I shared with the search committee, um, you know, I, I saw God work financially with ministry that I was involved in. Um, you know, usually with a ministry fundraise and you look for things, but as a board, we decided we wouldn't fundraise. We trust in God and we build ministry. 
And in the beginning, I was going under my breath, saying, it work. You know, we're going to be wasting our time when we're shutting the doors. And slowly, kept checking the checkbook, and more money was coming in, more money was coming in. And it got to the point to where our first year of ministry, we ended up in the black. And we had a budget of $30,000. And we didn't, I think we fundraised once, and we raised, I think, $2,500. God provided the rest, and I don't know where it all came from. And so I told our director of the ministry, and how we, how it transformed me, is saying, now I expect it. I expect to see God working. It's just what's he going to do with us? Surprise. Instead of looking and seeing a check come in and go, oh, wow, I can't believe a check came in. Now it's like, who did God work with this time? Who did he you know, say, I want to, I want to give? When we had issues last year, we had to do things like that on our own personal basis, which is very, very hard. And so I'm not up here just saying, well, you have to do it. It's hard. It is really hard to say, okay, God, I'm handing this over to you. You know, obviously I'm trusting you to do it, and God did it. God provided. Didn't do everything we wanted. I have justice issues, and I didn't think justice was served, and I got mad at God for that. But we know God handles everything on his own time. God handles everything in his own time. It's not up to me. And so there's time that you do get angry. And when you do live like this, and you're turning your life over to God, there is anger, there's frustration, there's fear, there's all these things that Satan wants you to give up and turn your life away. There's one uh, story, and you guys probably heard it before, about a seminary student who decided to give his life over to God and go into mission. And he said, God, I want to go. I want to give my whole life to you. But I want to go either to Australia, I want to go to South America, I want to go to maybe Europe, but I do not want to go to Africa. But I want to give my life to you. You know where God sent him? Africa. And off he went. And God does amazing things. Um, yeah, never say never, never say what you don't want to God, because he's got a great sense of humor, and he'll do it. Uh, and they always say that when you, when you pray and you ask for something, be prepared to get it. Don't just pray it and pray it, just to pray it, but expect it, and you'll be amazed. So we're called to be what? Living sacrifices to God. We're supposed to not just give a portion of our life, we're supposed to give all of our life to God. And then he'll equip us to serve. He wants us to do his work. He's going to do it through him, by him, through us. Not anything that we get to take credit for. So this year, as we're struggling, not looking at catalogs anymore, we a long time. But as we struggle to think about what we want to give to those around us, we really need to think about whose birthday it is. It's not our birthday. It's Christ's birthday. What are we going to give to him? Have we given everything over to him? Because that's what he's calling us to do. And one of the great things is if we were to do that, if we were to turn our whole life over to Christ, and we come in this building and we do what God calls us to do, amazing things would happen out of this building. Think about all that can be going on in this, in this community through this church if we did what God called us to do. If I did everything God called me to do, I'm going to go too. So may it be that, that part of your Christmas, that it could be different, a different kind of Christmas, not just with COVID, but how are we doing with our own life, giving over to Christ? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is timeless, that even as Isaiah speaks to those exiles rebuilding, uh, those exiles and coming back to rebuilding Jerusalem, that it still speaks to us. Jesus used it in, in his ministry. And so may we hear these words, may we transform, be transformed by you, by handing everything over to you. Help us to deal with the difficulty of doing that. The Lord, also, 
Help us to see the joy that comes in following you. Amen. All right, let's sing hymn number 249, O Come All Ye Faithful.